I am worthy of respect. I am worthy of respect. I am worthy of peace. I am worthy of peace. I am worthy of peace. I am worthy of work. 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 I'm worthy of justice. I am worthy of justice. I'm worthy of justice. I'm worthy of community. I'm worthy of community. I'm worthy of community. I am worthy of joy. I am worthy of joy. I'm worthy of joy. I am worthy of joy. You are worthy of respect. You are worthy of respect. You are worthy of peace. You are worthy of work. You are worthy of justice. You are worthy of community. You are worthy of joy. We are worthy of respect. We are worthy of peace. We are worthy of work. We are worthy of justice. We are worthy of community. We are worthy of humanity. We are worthy of joy. My name is Ochiko Prudence Daniels. I'm the founder of Mama Hill Montessori School, Lagos, Nigeria. The results that you know I see in them, the beautiful impact of the Montessori pedagogy in the life of the children really inspired me to question and to go deeper into what Montessori holds for uh, the world, for every child, for Africa, and for my country, Nigeria. Um, I started Mama Hill Montessori School to probably answer a call, like people will say the Montessori ball beat me. Yes, I'm one of them. I'm very passionate about what I do right now. Yeah, because Montessori is a peace education. Montessori brings peace. It's an education that helps the child to develop in totality. So the beauty of what I see in my two children, I want it for everyone in Africa. I want it for everyone in Nigeria and globally. So here at Mama Hill, I am trying to uh, uh, go ahead with the practice of Montessori in a way that it is global. 
to align with whatever it takes to bring the authentic Montessori to the children who are opportune or privileged to be in this environment. But we want the impact to be on everyone. Like for people who will never hear about Montessori or probably will not be opportune to encounter Montessori, we want to reach out to them. That's why we brought the school to this location. We want Montessori for everyone, we want Montessori for every child. And we want to involve parents you know, educating them about the Montessori uh, pedagogy, the Montessori system, and how important it is in the life of the child. Yeah, for the government of my country, I want to more like question why they haven't bought into the Montessori system as a charter or as a government-sponsored uh, program in Nigeria. But individuals who are listening to me and you hear my word about this Montessori, I would like to uh, encourage you to let's join hands to drive this Montessori process. Uh, Montessori will make our country a better place. Montessori will bring peace. Montessori will calm all the uh, crises that we encounter in Nigeria today. So I implore every one of us to join hands to let's give our children the best foundation that they can have. A foundation that is in totality, that helps the child to develop in every aspect, whether morally, um, emotionally, scientifically, academically, and most importantly, um, intellectually. And then the children are well normalized. Hi everyone, I'm Nia Seal, and today I'm asking for your generous donation of $150 to support the Black Montessori Education Fund in honor of Dr. Montessori's 150th birthday. 150 years ago, Dr. Montessori was born and she went on to dedicate her life to making this world a better place for children, not just some children. She had a dream and a vision of a world where all children could grow up to be the best that they could possibly be, which in turn creates a society that we all want to live in. So I'm asking for your donation today to support the Black Montessori Education Fund in providing access to quality Montessori education for black children black teachers because quality education quality Montessori education is not just for some of us it's for all of us thank you donate today $150 thank you thank you for uh, for joining me in um, child panel uh, in the one day um, global events, we would like to challenge uh, all Montessorians all over the world uh, to, to reconsider the assumption that we make about our children, um, to also reconsider about the way we inadvertently sometimes exclude the children in the way we make decisions. And uh, from that, we want to come together and talk about ways in which um, we can be more accepting to own, up, uh, to own up our children. So I'd like to get started with um, um, Gabrielle Salomão. Um, so you are a Montessori parent and uh, you were also a Montessori student from the age of uh, 2 to 14. Uh, currently you are a Montessori researcher and um, your doctorate degree is studying monastery in the contemporary media, media and uh, you founded an online platform called the Law, Law Monastery. It is the biggest online platform uh, in the language of Portuguese. Uh, Dr. Laura Flores Shaw, you are currently teaching at, the, at an assistant professor at the uh, John Hopkins. Hopskin in the uh, program of teaching certificate and the doctor of education uh, and this program is online. Excitingly, you also the founder of the white paper press 
and uh, it has been um, translating the scientific research into the everyday terms for 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 people to uh, to be able to have accessibility to to it. Um, uh, another area of expertise that I'm excited about is that you extensively you are extensively trained in family system therapy and also in the educational neuroscience uh, field studies. Uh, you were also uh, a monastery parent and a former monastery head of school, Trisha Mokino, and. Uh, I am excited about this as well because I just watched a video from your school, Keres Children's Learning Center. It is a dual language and cultural immersion monastery program in the Santa Fe area of New Mexico. You, uh, because your passion in bilingual education is supported by your master degree in bilingual education and. Uh, you also is a very passionate cheerleader of the um, BIPOC children. Um, you're known on social media as the indigenous cheerleader. I want to make sure I put the terminology in here. BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, and Pupil of Color. And you are the indigenous cheerleader for our children. You were trained in elementary of monastery education as well. My name is Kim Nguyen Anderson, and uh, my, um, my work is between here and the U.S. I'm working to make monastery training available in the Vietnamese language for Vietnamese children as well as Vietnamese educators. Uh, before I fell in love with monastery education, I was working in international and public education, and that led me to receiving my master's degree in literacy and curriculum design locally here at the California University System. I also uh, consult and gu provide guidance for uh, school owners as well as parents. Uh, currently, I'm also enjoying be being the moderator of the biggest monastery uh, teacher Facebook group. When we look at characteristics of the children, um, they haven't changed. And what have changed over the year is our societies. When society changes, it influences on the development of our children. Do you agree with that statement? And do you think that monastery education is still relevant? Uh, well, I guess um, uh, whether or not Montessori is relevant, uh, absolutely. <laughs> it is absolutely relevant. Um, for today's children. I, I would say, though, I'm a little skeptical of whether or not um, the characteristics that we see change, right? Because I think that when people are interacting with an environment, and that's a dynamic uh, experience. And so, you know, might we be seeing slightly different things than what Dr. Montessori saw in the context and uh, the time in which she was observing children. Um, you know, empirically, I don't know for sure what the answer to that is. I think that most everything changes in some way or another. So generally we might be seeing some similarities, but we also might be seeing um, some differences there. And also in terms of seeing differences, we might be judging those differences in a way uh, that isn't very helpful to um, our interaction with the children as the adults in the environment. I love words. And I think that when we, we talk about the child, the child is just a word. I mean, uh, we refer to uh, the child as child, and that's a word. And, and meanings change in history. They change in, in geography. They, they change in, in many different ways. So when we ask, do children change? Yeah, of course they do. Uh, maybe they change because of the interaction with the environment. Probably they didn't change much biologically, uh, considering Dr. Montessori wrote um, just a little bit uh, ago. I don't know if children change. That's very hard to answer. But the way we think about them, changed so much. 
And I think uh, the Montessori method or the Montessori system of thought is tremendously important, not only for the effects uh, it has on children, uh, on their um, happiness and joy of life and even their development, also because the whole system of thought that Dr. Montessori offered us helps us to think about children and childhood in ways that generally society don't promote by itself. Newspapers, media, popular books don't necessarily promote. It's complex, it's systemic, and it challenges us to think about children in, in very interesting ways. So yeah, I think it's relevant and maybe it's mainly relevant for us to see children in, is still in a new way a hundred years later. Thank you for that. Um, and I, I, I think it come back to what you uh, and Laura both touched on, right? It is that evolving way of society and caregivers uh, interacting with the children. I like to, to call on Trisha to share more about this question, you know, and the relevance of Dr. Montessori work for the children of the indigenous, you know, our regions. So I want to just say that for indigenous people here in the United States, there's over, you know, 527 federally recognized tri tribes. So we're not a monolith, but I do think there are a lot of similarities. I know there are a lot of similarities um, because I've heard it from our brothers and sisters from other tribes. But in terms of um, how or not um, children, I guess, have changed, I appreciate what Gabrielle had to say about, um, you know, just what Montessori uh, reminds us is to look at children, you know, based off of all her observations that she had made in terms, I think, especially in terms of the human tendencies, which I think we do still see today. You know those you know those tendencies of the need for work, the need for concentration, the need for repetition, the need for exactness and precision, the need for self perfection like those are still very much things that we see um, in our children today, but as a society, as my people, culturally linguistically, and so i I want to center language language first because everything comes from our language, our world. Um, view our indigenous knowledge systems the way we view children comes from is, in, is embedded in our in our care's language and so that itself is still intact when you understand our language and you listen to the way children are revered how we see them as gifts um, and that is what attracted me to Montessori is that she also saw them as coming you know they, they embody a spirit and they have a cosmic test they have a purpose and so that philosophy really aligned with um with ours which is why we chose that method to help us with language revitalization so again going back to what Gabrielle was saying in terms of have we changed as the adults um i think that's what has changed because of and with the inception of boarding schools and the the violence that settler colonial education inflicted on our great grandparents and how that disrupted parenting patterns grandparenting patterns i don't see i don't think so much that our tribe our tribes were as affect, as affected but we were affected revitalizing a language our language is remembering and reclaiming and restoring the way we see children the way we respect children um, and it also reminds us to have a balance because we have been shamed into assimilating that that education is within you know the boundaries of these four walls when our people were educating and teaching children for thousands of years in our language. What I appreciate about Montessori is that she reminds everybody else that this is how we should value our children. And going back to indigenous people, like we already had these philosophies. She wasn't the first one to come up with the philosophy. You know, in, indigenous people all over the world have philosophies about children. Hers, you know, she was just able to amplify it and it was able to spread. Um, and so we get to see um, the benefit of that. So that is what I appreciate about that. Um, I'm just curious about the 
perception of our children and how it has been changed in your um, in your local community. There has been a, 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 a slow but steady movement of mainly parents who have been discovering non-violent and pacifical ways to live with children. And I like to distinguish non-violent and pacifical because uh, it's not just to deny violence. And Montessori would remind us that it's not just a question of uh, denying war and preventing war. It's also a question of building peace. And there has been a slow and steady movement of parents that stop it, for example, uh, beating their children and uh, punishing them severely. Uh, so slowly... Uh, parents are changing their views and what is happening that's very interesting and I could watch that happen because of my work with parents in Brazil is that uh, while uh, parents change uh, sorry because parents change schools change uh, it, it's that chain effect that that you know highlight the the work that parents need to to do and educators need to do and and we need to go forward with the same trajectory and I think monetary principles are guiding us and that is this is an exciting time it is ironic to say this in a pandemic but I think this is an exciting time that we will see changes in the way we work with our children in the U.S. well in California my uh, positive discipline trainer said to me she had to tell parents don't hit your children And then that changed to, you need to t tell your child no. <laughs> And you need to set boundaries with your child. So what we have seen in the States is quite a, a pendulum shift. You know, we went from kind of one extreme uh, to another. The thing that I think is so useful for parents in terms of Montessori is that there's this beautiful space where The, the child is given the physical, psychological, and emotional space to construct themselves and to exercise their agency, right? So that self-construction occurs through exercising the agency and through interaction with the environment. So it gives a child the space to, to do that, which uh, allows them to be able to also self-differentiate so they can know They, as they construct themselves, they know their own thoughts and feelings from those of others. And, and so you end up with children who end up with a very strong sense of self, but at the same time, there, there are boundaries within this space. So follow the child does not just mean let the child do whatever they want, whenever they want, however it pleases them. You know, they're, they are, the child is part of a system. And so what they choose to do that actually affects the other parts of the system. And so they learn this and they experience this in their interaction with, their, uh, with the environment. So from a family systems perspective, and this is actually the reason why I came to Montessori, it allows that space for self-differentiation, for self-construction, but at the same time, it's a safe space to do it because there are boundaries. And actually when there are no boundaries, uh, people tend to feel more out of control and they feel less safe. So uh, it's, a, it's a framework that we can bring into our homes and use with our children. I, I just love it when, when you explain so beautifully the concept of how boundaries make our children feel safer. I mean, that just, it, there's so much going on there. And I grew up in the 80s in Vietnam and uh, You know, we were still pulling water from well. You know, we still uh, having electricity that, you know, go in and out. Um, you know, a lot of corporal punishment now is gone in the family, in the school. And all of these things, we see them evolving over the year. But uh, there are that part that our parents still need help, you know, and Often people say, oh, monastery classroom, the children can do whatever they want. When I think about the Casa children, they, they love a beautiful environment. They want the order. They want the beauty. Everything is about external order, right? The routine and everything. As we touched early on, we talk about so much repetition. 
you know, they take one thing out, they work with it, they put it away, and they make sure that everything need to be put back so their peer can use it. And if there's a peer waiting for using, they go to them and say, I'm finished, would you like to use it? They have this, you know, defined space for them to learn, right? You know, the work rug on the table. From that, they develop respect for, for the self within them. They develop a, res- you know, a sense of respect for their peer space. They take in turn, taking care of their environment. It's not the adult environment, it's their environment. And so with that foundation, it's create a beautiful layer for the elementary child. When the child go into the elementary years, which is the six to 12 years, they start to form deeper sense of moral. They have moral development and imagination. You know, they have responsible independence and their identity and their attraction going away from the environment. Now it's focusing on their peers. You know, they learn the socialization of the community. And because of that, they have the needs to, to be able to collaborate, to build that social bonding. That from the outside, people call it, you know, they can do whatever they want. Right, <laughs> so um, the elementary children they want to be guided with lots of room for you know balance, negotiation, and compromising, and uh, creativity is important for them. They want that creativity risk, and we want our parents to have that creativity risk, you know, in the surrounding environment at home for them. Um, so we call them chaos within order. And when I think about that, I think that video of all of these thousands or hundreds of scooters going down the street in Vietnam, and you look from a boat, <laughs> you're standing and you look from a boat, and it feel like, oh my goodness, I am going to get run over. And that's how the monastery classroom look like, right? If, if you walk in the first time, you're like, I don't want to walk because I might step on children, walk on my bum into the children, or maybe I might interrupt their deep, deep concentration. And I think that is very hard for parents and um, the general public to understand what monastery looks like. So I'm going to call on Gabrielle. How do we talk, talk about this in relation to the stage, stages of obedience? I think there are two ways of understanding why we like so much to to listen and talk and and try to understand obedience. The first reason, of course, is that many adults would like obedient children, and uh, Montessori calls our attention to that. But then the other uh, thing, I think, is that obedience is so complicated to to understand. When I talk to parents and, and explain that, Obedience is the, the, compli- the, the complex process of understanding your own will, not acting on your own will, understanding the will of another person and acting on the will of this other person. All those parents of three-year-olds, four-year-olds, and I was that parent as well, and, and I was uh, surprised when I read, surprised is not the right word for that, and I can't find the right word right now. Because we think of obedience without really understanding how complex it is for a small child to obey. And so what Montessori teaches us when she explains the three stages of obedience, there is a three stage that is the building of the will. You, you have to, to construct the will inside yourself before being able to really obey. And that's the work of the very small child from from zero to uh, three, around three, or or just before three, uh, that building of the will. And then once the will is kind of built inside the child, she or he can start to obey. But at first, she's not able to obey always. Uh, Sometimes she does, sometimes she doesn't. Because her will doesn't uh, fit into the order that the adult gives him or her. And then later, he or she is able to obey all the time because he or she is able to understand, they are able to understand 
the suggestion, the order that, or the favor that we ask of them. Uh, but being able to do something is not necessarily the same thing as wanting, wishing to do that. So uh, that you are able to eat uh, broccoli uh, doesn't necessarily mean that you want to eat broccoli right now. And so uh, being able to obey doesn't necessarily mean that you want to obey right now. And so in this second stage of obedience, we really run the risk of using too many punishments and prizes and incentives uh, to make the child obey, because we understand that uh, they are finally able to obey, and we were anxious for that to happen. So we use everything at our disposal to make the child obey. And that might make the third stage of obedience impossible. The third stage of obedience would be the stage in which the child really wants to obey. And I really like the passage in which, in which Dr. Montessori says why the child wants to obey. And she says uh, that the child looks at us, at, at us, not necessarily, but at the adult uh, that, she wa- that he or she wants to obey. And they think, here is someone so far above me that she can exert an influence on my mind and make me as clever as she is. She acts inside me. When we adults look at someone that we admire deeply, and that we obey because it's reasonable. This person is so intelligent, so wise. Uh, it would be dumb not to obey. When we look to this person that we deeply admire and whatever this person asks of us, we do. Uh, that, that happens because of admiration. And so uh, I try to say to parents that the child in this third stage of obedience, the child obeys the adult they admire. So while our work is to become an admirable adult, and the child admires, of course, he or she, the adult, that is able to understand this little child that, of course, is not always understood and often oppressed and exploited. And there is this adult that does understand, this adult that is able to build an environment that works, that allows for work and for joy. So that's it. I find it fascinating, really. It changes how we see the child obedience discipline and our relation to the child. I love this topic. Okay, well, thank you, Gabrielle. Trisha, I'm just wondering that the um, monastery approach to discipline, is it a good tool for undoing, you know, the colonization that was done to the indigenous people uh, and, and, and... also, if, if I may ask you to touch on the, a little bit on the traditional carers rhythm, reason, you know, about discipline. To your first question about decolonization, I would say yes and no. Because Montessori, as it exists, and the way it has been, that the way it has evolved, I think, in American society and other settler colonial societies, and so I would say across the board in North America, Central America, South America, Canada, like that that whole area, they're all considered settler colonial societies because you still very much have tribes in existence who have their own way of, of seeing children. And so with Montessori, everything that um, Dr. Laura talked about in terms of like she was talking about positive discipline and you know how Montessori does a really beautiful job of giving children that self-efficacy, the, the agency to care for self, to self-construct. Um, you used another word, um, self-differentiation is the word that she used. So in that way, yes, it's really beautiful. So what's problematic about that, though, is it's still very much steeped in individualism. And so in settler colonial societies, that's an active event that is happening where a foreign people, in this case, um, started with European Americans, their ancestors came in to take and commit genocide against the people that were already living here, which were our, the indigenous peoples here in this area, as has, has happened in what is now known as Mexico, Central America, South America. 
So we have to be cognizant in having this conversation that are, there are very much tribes that are alive in South America, in Brazil, in Peru, who are actively fighting against just to, to, to keep their languages alive, to keep their way of life alive. When it comes to discipline, you know, you hear that, that saying, um, it takes a village to raise a child. And I just think that that is so disingenuous and it's been co-opted because I don't see a lot of people in America really living like that. They talk about it and it, they're, they're nice words to say, but I don't see a lot of people really living like that. And that we're very grateful for, for what's still true for us in our communities, in our tribes. Um, I could only speak here in the Pueblos, the areas that I'm from, um, but I know certainly certain other tribes, we are still accountable to our communities. And so we teach our children that I am very much supported in my family, in my community, in my clan, in my extended family, that if one of my nieces and nephews does something good and not so good, that they're going to hear about it from the rest of the family. And then they're going to hear about it from the, from the community. And a lot of the times, most of the times, it's good. But we don't live in a vacuum, right? We don't live just by ourselves. We are also um, influenced um, by the dominant culture. You know, taking that into consideration and then the way that back to boarding schools and public schools and how it's very a very punitive system also affected you know parenting patterns so you know it's a that's a very loaded question so i think what we try to do with montessori what how she talks about awards and praise that very much aligns with how like traditionally i think maybe in our grand, grand great grandparents generation you know how that is a lot more aligned with us. I think when it comes to this idea of discipline, it's also that idea that we want children to take initiative. We want children to be able to learn how to work. And yes, that in the sense of Montessori, how she considered work as play, but also that the children know that they're a sacred part, a valid part of our tribes, of our communities, and that we value they're, what they're able to give back to their communities. So discipline doesn't just happen in the family. Discipline um, and the teach, how we teach our children very much happens in the extended family. And there's that element of accountability that I don't see in public schools, um, that I did not see in the Bureau of Indian Education schools, uh, that I did not see in private schools that I taught at, at New York but that is very much alive in our tribes and that is very much alive um, through the intergenerationality that we've worked really hard to have at Karis Children's Learning Center. Thank you. You know, you, you challenge us as educator and parents to really think about what is it that, um, that we consider uh, the right thing to do. You know, you talk about language, you know, like how language preserves a culture, you know, how language preserves the structure of the society and, um, you know, the difference between individualism and how we hold ourselves accountable to our immediate community and the community beyond our immediate community, which is essentially the planet, right, that we're living in. Different, you know, in the sense of individualism, um, that is something that when you said I immediately can relate to uh, to my uh, my c country of birth, right? And I, when I think about the younger parents, you know, the parents whose children are in early childhood now, in elementary, um, how how challenging challenging it is for them to balance that uh, multi generational home setting, you know, like. Our, the grandparents would like to be part of the of the raising, you know, of, of the children, and our our grandparents have different perspective 
the society, you know, put a lot of conditions and then what the individual parents with their, um, with their education, their different education compared to their parent, parents. All of those things in encompassing, you know, it compartmentalized this very complex, you know, um, situation that we are having. I want to just remind myself that we're all here because we love Montessori and it is a tool for liberation. But it can only be a tool for liberation if not just white people, but also people of the global majority really interrogate um, the ways in which whiteness steeps into how we view family, how we view children, how we, how we view community and through whose lens um, community is defined. And so I think in, t in thinking about children in public settings, as, you know, a, a lot of our own indigenous children in the United States, 90% of them are in public school settings. You hear a lot of educators and early childhood people say parents and families are the first educators. Really, are they? Because public schooling has really taken that away, especially from our people. It's, you know, the way they came into our communities, first with boarding schools, and then with Bureau of Indian Education, BIE schools, and then day schools, and then now, as it exists, public schools. When our children are away from us seven hours a day, you know, often on our own lands, but in a remote setting, I don't know that public schools value that because if they valued that we'd see our grandmas and grandpas in our schools every day we'd see our aunties and uncles we'd see our children's godparents in our schools every day and there would be a real integration of parents and the extended family they would be offered that invitation to say what can you teach our children and we would be saying our children. We wouldn't just saying be saying my child. And so I want to just reference back to like often you, in Montessori, it is you, people are saying the child, but we should be saying BIPOC children, Black Indigenous people of color children, because to say the child, if 90% of teachers are white, not just in Montessori, but in public education, what children, what child is coming to mind? And I'm pretty sure it's not an indigenous child because there's so much erasure that is happening. So I think we would see that piece in schools in terms of bringing, truly bringing in the community. I think of my own grandma and, you know, the freedom that we give children to explore because we still live in a rural area, giving them time outside, but then, you know, setting those boundaries but not just giving them freedom giving them that real work like if we're making bread in our outdoor ovens how are we including children in that when we when our children makes a mistake how are we disrupting that white supremacist characteristic of perfectionism how how are we saying it, it's okay to make a mistake let me show you how you correct it but what we're reminded from our elders is that we do it from love and that we remember that we also have a responsibility, not just to each other in our communities. We have a responsibility to steward our land. We have a responsibility to steward the animals and the plants and the water that we live with together. And so when we talk about discipline, it's also teaching the discipline of how do we teach our children to be in good relationship with, yes, with each other as, as human beings, but with our lands, our water, and the other um, living beings with plants and animals. Those are just some of the things that I have been taught that we're passing on to our own children. So I really appreciate you um, including me in this conversation and allowing me to answer that question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, truly, I, uh, I think um, you, you challenged us to, to do the work on our part as parents and as educators and as general public to, uh, to not only protect the loving truth within the children, you know, help them shine who they are, but also take part in it, uh, you know, to, to educate them together. And I think um, 
I, I will look at the way parents requesting to be part of their child's learning journey very differently. In the Montessori context, the concept of work of the child, how is it different from the concept of work uh, from the adult's point of view? That children, they want to be a part of learning, not just in their family, but in their community. So in our tribes, we do a lot of things communally. And so we do our best to give our children the opportunity to help. You know, of course, we see that in the classroom that there are very specific jobs that we give um, children the opportunity to refine. Um, we, support that. We, we support children in that way, and it's very much aligned with us. I, I love it, and I think it blends very well with our own beliefs around integrating children into the work of the adults that we often do as a community. So yeah, I think it, it aligns greatly. Thank you. I think I'm going to reiterate a little bit um, what I, I was hearing just to make sure that we, um, we get your uh, sharing in. So you were sharing that, you know, it's, it's very important for indigenous, you know, culture to make uh, activities communal and for the student to, and the children, you know, when they're at home to, to collaborate and to take part in and refine, you know, their skill at one of these real life activity going on, you know, whether at home, whether outdoor school or in the classroom as Dr. Monastery uh, described very well in her work. Thank you, Kimena, and I just want to say if I get cut off, I want to say thank you to you and Andy and to Dr. Laura and to soon to be Dr. Gabrielle for all your work. Uh, with education and monastery education and all of our children and that I appreciate what I also learned from you. Um, I'm staying on as long as I can, but I would get cut off. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just, I'm just curious if you can just share with us a little bit regarding to your research on movement and cognition. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, it is really incredible. Dr. Montessori saw through her systematic observation of children that there's this link between movement and cognition. And there's a link between movement, cognition, and emotion regulation, right? So through these movements, they're regulating themselves. And we're really coming from an understanding now that the reason that we have brains is in order to move. It's not to think, but we are very focused on our thinking. Actually, the reason that we have the ability to think is in order to engage in more complex interactions. And so, because if you, if, you, if you don't need to move, you actually don't need a brain. So we were born to move first, and then higher cognition comes, comes out, evolved out of that. When we develop a, a large repertoire of automatic movements, so movements that we can do without consciously thinking of them. That frees up our attention, if you think of attention as a spotlight, and allows our attention to then focus on novel things, learn new things, or um, to engage in a higher level uh, creative thinking and problem solving, right? So if you think about a child who's just learning to write, for instance, so all of the attention spotlight is really focused on the actual physical act of writing. But once they can actually do that writing automatically, then they're able to write a creative story. And so, so much of the work early on for children is what they're doing in Montessori is they're building that large repertoire of automatic movements. And so then we see this real creativity, this real explosion happen around age five. We had a policy at our school that you couldn't, you could not take your child out of the primary program in the last year of the program. Because not only were you stopping the momentum of your own individual child, but you were also compromising the experience of the, that classroom community, right? Because you have, now you're taking out a child who has just get, is just getting to the point of mastery of a lot of the works and is about to see them in a whole different way. And then you take them out and now we, we don't have a leader in the, in the classroom. We don't have another child who's inspiring younger children to want to do that bigger work. Um, so so it was really, it's really important to get parents to understand they do come often because they want their 
individual child to benefit from Montessori without recognizing that there's a larger system that's going on here. And so you, it's very important as a Montessori parent to uh, gain a systems perspective and to not focus on your child as a silo. <laughs> and think about too, we take movement for granted and think about something as simple as reaching. You know, typically reaching is not something that is fully really mastered until around age nine, because think about how many different objects you have to reach for. And they're all different sizes and shapes and weights, and you're reaching at different angles. And so how many times you need to reach for things in order to perfect reaching and being, being able for, for your brain to be able to look at an object and know exactly where to put your hand in order to grasp, you know, reach for it and grasp it and do something with it. All of this movement, what it allows is for um, adaptability. So ultimately, I see Montessori as really a pedagogy of adaptability. So again, gaining all of these, the, these skills and this large repertoire of automatic movements, you know, uh, children can plan, they can direct their own learning. That requires practice. And so we can talk about self-regulated learning. There's a huge body of research on this in conventional education. And every time I step into a conventional education classroom, I always wonder, when do they actually have time to practice the movements involved in self-regulated learning? If you have an environment where it's, it's adult-directed and the, the adult is telling the children what to do, when to do, it, when to do it, and how to do it, there's no time to actually practice those movements. And those movements are incredibly important. That's why keeping your children in Montessori for as long as possible is incredibly important because when they do go to conventional education, you know, as mine did, the movements that they're going to engage in, the actions that they're going to engage in, in that environment are very, very different. And so I'm always trying to get my students who are conventional, generally conventional teachers to think about what, what are they learning to do Movement is the child work. To decide when to have snack, when not to have snack, is the child work, right? Where to work, how to work, who to work with, is the child's work. All of this is the process of making the decision that we need to let them have a say in it. And, you know, a lot of time we at Monastery Educator, we think that the child's work is working at many equipments as possible making many, you know, check through many chapters as possible, Go th going through the sequence. It's not that. That is just one way in many different ways that child's work is manifested. Could you share with us why, why is joy so essential? You first have to nourish your joy, your happiness, to be able to deeply concentrate. Uh, it's hard to concentrate if you are troubled, if you are uh, very sad, if you are very angry, uh, you have to nourish your own joy. And I think Montessori brings that to us when she teaches us that the teacher has to start with showing these children that the environment is a very interesting place, it's a very good place to be. That is the, the beautiful, I think, uh, side of this question. And then there is a, a more complex side of this question, maybe not so beautiful, that uh, joy is the difference between work and forced labor for the child. So if the child is in a place uh, that offers labor, uh, so for example, you can have lessons and homework and so on and so forth that is unpleasant to do, and, and uh, not in accordance with development and with needs and tendencies, uh, this child may do the work, uh, but this work is actually forced labor. This child is working not for herself, but for another. And we don't see it that way. When we see children in school, we thank uh, God and the goddess that this child is in school. And of course we should. Even conventional school is much better than no school at all or in, in many contexts 
than uh, being actually doing forced labor somewhere. So uh, school generally is a good thing for, for society. Of course, there is difficulty and the child may face some anxiety uh, because the activity is very hard for him or her. And that's fine if, if the child chose the activity and uh, they are doing it out of choice and it may be really hard and the child may be really sad that it was uh, impossible to finish that and so on. But most of the time, the child has to know that joy is available. The child does not need to feel joyful all the time, but they need to know joy is available. Uh, so there is the beautiful side and the complex political, uh, sociological side, but that's what I, I think joy is, is relevant. Yes, yes, joy is available. This is joy. This is the work that we love doing and we need to make sure we are not making the, side, the, the child acceptable to forced learning, right? And, and I think that's why the prepare environment, the prepare adult, and the child enter to that room, joy is blossoming for them. And um, any last words before we uh, conclude our panel today? Um. Okay, well, I'll just say uh, thank you so much for having this. And I think that this is incredibly useful and important, to, uh, not just for Montessori educators, but definitely for, for parents who are maybe exploring Montessori. And I highly, highly encourage you to explore Montessori for your children, because I know for my own children, it really created a very, very solid foundation. And uh, I see the benefits daily. Sometimes even if they don't see it, I do. <laughs> and uh, so, but thank you. Thank you for, uh, for hosting us and, and putting this together. Well, thank you very much uh, for making this happen. Uh, and what I want to, to share is something that Montessori shares with us, uh, that from small things, great things can come. And so when we first see Montessori, even in an event like this, that it's 24 hours of Montessori, it's so much to explore. And when we look to her books, it's so much, and the training is so long and so deep, so it can seem to someone who, who, who's starting to, to look at it, insurmountable. Uh, it, it can seem impossible. And I'd just like to suggest that if we can smile to our children and we can see that our children are also smiling and they are serene, they, they are calm, they are smiling, they, they are happy with their own lives and we can be happy together, we, in a very, we are in a very good place to start. And we can go on uh, calmly. We, we don't have to rush. We don't have to feel insufficient. Uh, we can explore this. And there is so much to explore. And please do. There is so much. It's so fascinating. And the full thing gives so many benefits to children and for our relationship with them. But if we can start with a smile, if we can start just being with our children peacefully, that's a very, very good start for us. And that's it. Thank you so much for this. Thank you. And then I think in this, uh, you know, virtual reality that we're facing, so we, want, we want to make sure our children learn through nature, right? In the indefinite possibility that we're having nowadays, we want our students to continue to be curious and monastery, Dr. Monastery provided with that. So um, I, I appreciate this opportunity. And uh, to close off our conversation today, um, uh, I just want to make sure to remind everyone to check the email for the link to the live Zoom sessions that happening in the Connect Pavilion, where we can talk about or we can chat more about what we talk about today. Thank you so much and have a great day or night wherever you are. Bye.